was only polite. Now, as the man in the baby costume said, I've known this man for nine years, by the way, and I'm not all right with it. He said <laughs> that Valentine's Day is fast approaching, and indeed it is. Now, around this time of year, people tend to ask me, Andrew, what is it that makes you so much of a stud? Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> then they'll say, is there some sort of volume, perhaps, we can read of your sexual exploits? And my answer is, chapter one. <laughs> Innocence. <laughs> now, at the age of seven, I received my first and only Valentine's Day present. It was from a girl in my class, by which I mean educational class, not social strata. My <laughs> method of choosing a romantic partner by class is very much the same as choosing a car seat. It's middle or nothing, I'm afraid. <laughs> And this was marvellous. The fact that it was from a girl was somewhat suboptimal, but I, uh, I seem to remember her tears as I told her as much. <laughs> <laughs> the thing was, is we, 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 we clawed it back from that. We spent a whirlwind romance. We held hands on the yard. We dined together in the dinner hall, and then she tried to kiss me, and I cried and pretended to be dead. <laughs> You see, and we go to that purveyor of romantic situations, I refer, of course, to Mackie D's. Now, I never went on a date to Mackie D's, but I am going to uh, McDonald's, for those of you who don't know the streetwise lingo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and paint you a word picture now of what I imagine it was probably like. So you've got your date. Imagine with me. We move. We weave between the cool kids hanging around the front with their McFlurries and their pointy words. <laughs> we go in. We are assigned a table quickly. We've already told the maitre d' that we're coming. <laughs> <laughs> then I go and get a straw and perhaps a wet wipe for a napkin <laughs> while she peruses the saver menu. Then I pay with a voucher off a bus ticket and £2.50 I got from the long for my lunch. <laughs> and then she's like putty in your hand. <laughs> Believe me. Oh. Chapter 3. Casual sex. <laughs> <laughs> now, we move on from those days, and by this point, we've been doing six years solid of Mackie D dates. <laughs> six years solid, solid, unlike our bowel movements, because after six years of fast food, solid is more of a wistful ambition for this. <laughs> <laughs> so we move on to university. University. And university becomes sort of more ballsy, sort of more willing to go out and do whatever it is you do. So a friend of mine, uh, he had, uh, over six days, um, coital interaction with six separate individuals. Now, I've never been in this situation, linked perhaps to my use of the phrase coital interaction. <laughs> but he had, and what's impressive, what's impressive wasn't that he'd, you know, sown his seed with such vigour. It was instead <laughs> that he couldn't remember the names of any of these girls. <laughs> any of them. Now, if I forget someone's name, I'll tend to say, sorry, I'm forgotten your name, would you mind telling me instead of, would you like a shag? <laughs> I think that usually that question doesn't get as much traction, especially from me, but it can sort of get to ridiculous extremes. So you can go through the entire of your life not knowing the name of your significant other until you get to your wedding day. And the vicar says, Andrew, would you say Vera to be your lawfully wedded wife? I say, yes, Vera! That's right! Everyone, this is Vera, my lawfully wedded wife! Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> Sam, chapter four. We're really rolling on through now. There's only five chapters, don't worry. <laughs> True love, it's chapter four. Now, this can come at any stage. Uh, I saw it the other day on the bus, a couple eating a pot noodle. Not <laughs> the same pot noodle, their own individual pot noodles. <laughs> no, that's the wrong way around. <laughs> Please forgive me while I revert, quickly. <laughs> Not their own individual pot noodles. <laughs> they share pot noodles. <laughs> I really did. That's what I want, okay? And it's, it's, it's tepid mush in a plastic cup, but it's with the girl of your dreams. And I, I don't ask for much. It wouldn't even need to be Bombay bad boy. So if I was with her, it could be sausage. You know? Could be anything. Hello. My name is Josh. I am 105 years old, and I was born in the year 1995. Hello. My name is Matt. I am 100 years old. I was 100 years old, and I was born in the year 2000. Hey, my name is Mandrex. 
I'm 63 years old and I was born in the year 2037. I think my strongest childhood memory comes from about 2008. We're sitting at home and then me ma comes in from home, from work at the farm and she says, to, she has this terrified look on her face and I says to her, what's wrong ma? She says, I'm sorry Josh, it's old Bessie, she's collapsed. Old Bessie was my family's name for the stock market. <laughs> It was a troubling time, the credit crunch. <laughs> we couldn't afford to keep little Scrunty, so we had to have him terminated. Little Scrunty was my nickname for our Sky subscription. <laughs> <laughs> my own never quite felt the same without the sound of him yapping away, providing sports entertainment and biased news coverage at a affordable price. I remember the time the government brought in a new letter. It was a revolution in linguistics. They call it the Dingwa. <laughs> I was middle-aged at the time, see, and I remember having to explain it to my kids. The hardest bit was teaching them how to pronounce it. I would spell it to them phonetically, you know, so I'd write it down on a piece of paper. D. I. Dingwa. Q. Dingwa again. F. And I'd sing a little song, you know, we all know it, the one that goes, a, B, C, D, ding, what, E, F, G, I, double, ding, what, J, and K. <laughs> of course, after they brought the double, ding, what in, they didn't need the other half of the alphabet. Made things a lot simpler. Hey, easy as A, B, ding, what, I'll grind you that. I think the one song that I've always loved, ever since I was a boy as well, I'm, I'm sure you all know it, it's the one that goes, Hey, now you're an all-star, get your game on, go play. <laughs> Yes, yes, I know it might seem trite to say that our national anthem is my favourite song. <laughs> but God damn it, I love it anyway. You see, um, the lyrics really spoke to me. I think they were really quite prophetic for the rest of my life. You see, um, well, the years did start coming and, well, they definitely didn't stop coming. Apart from that one year where they did. <laughs> Yes, I think I should like it played at my funeral. I can't quite imagine a more appropriate way to drift off into the abyss than to the dulcet tones of Ian Smashmouth and his friends. <laughs> I suppose the song's really rather archaic now. What with the line, she was looking kind of dumb with her finger and her thumb and the shape of an L on her forehead. No one uses L anymore. Too many right angles. I suppose a more appropriate line would be the shape of a ding what <laughs> on her forehead. All the best swear words start with ding what. I remember the time the Loch Ness monster came out as gay. <laughs> <laughs> the media had a field day. Though admittedly that was more because he'd come out at all. <laughs> the gay thing was really more of an aside. <laughs> It's, it's hardly a surprise, I mean, I don't suppose there are many lady Nessies in that lock, and when one spends all day looking at one's own reflection in the water, there isn't much one can use to draw inspiration from when one does the, uh, monster mash. <laughs> I remember the day they first put a moon on the man. <laughs> you remember what it was he said? He said, this is one small step for mankind, and one giant moon on that man!
Uh, she wanted us to do that, but in our, our local theme park, which is called Pleasureland. It wasn't fun. <laughs> Uh, but no, yeah, she wanted us to do that um, in the fair, interact with the children. And uh, I was I was a teddy bear, so I had this big teddy bear costume on. And uh, you know, it was a pretty it was a pretty easy job. I just had to walk around the fair, and wave and smile. Well, I didn't have to smile because I had a big bear head on. So inside the costume, I was just kind of. <laughs> but you know, that was just that was just for one weekend. And uh, there was something quite weird happened on the last day, on the Sunday evening. As everyone was leaving the park, I was just sort of wandering around as a bear, and I felt, this, I felt this hand tap my shoulder, and I turned around, and this woman handed me her child, and I, I don't mean like a five-year-old or like a toddler, it was, it was a newborn baby wrapped up in a blanket, and she just, she just gave it to me, she just handed me, and she didn't even say anything, and I couldn't say anything either, because I was a bear. <laughs> and I, you know, so I, I, took, I took the baby and held it, and sort of nodded at her and she took a step back to take a picture and I sort of was like, <laughs> oh here we go. And then, uh, then she took a few more steps back to get a, a better view. <laughs> and then she took a few more steps back towards the car park to get a <laughs> and to probably get some ba battery cameras out of the car or something. Um, and then she got in the car and she drove off, <laughs> uh, presumably to go home and get a different camera. <laughs> she left is what I'm saying. She, she came into the fair and gave her baby to me and then left. And it was, you know, it was a bit of a weird moment in my life to be honest, where I was, I didn't think I'd ever be, you know, stood in a fair, uh, in a bear costume, holding onto a stranger's baby, and say stranger was gone. And, uh, but there was just this, there was, there was about maybe a minute before security came and found me, where I had this baby and the mother got, was gone, and I just sort of looked down at this, at this child with my bare eyes and thought, oh, wow. This baby is mine now. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. I don't know why my mind went there. I suddenly lived in a, in a different universe where when a child is abandoned, that child becomes whoever finds the child first. You know, like a new parent, like some hideous finders keepers with children. And, and you know, and if that was the world we were living in, I mean, that does beg the question, I mean, whose baby was that? Was it mine? All the bears, because I mean, I wasn't going to be the bear again. You know, someone else was going to be the bear next week. So when I hand the costume over, I should be like, oh yeah, also you're responsible for this baby. <laughs> and then, and then every week, whenever the bear changes, and, and this this child just just ends up becoming owned by all these different people in a bear costume. And then what happens when no one's wearing the costume? Is that child temporarily orphaned? I mean. <laughs> You know, what's going on? <laughs> but, you know, I, I, whenever I think back to this this time when I was, you know, just 16, I'm left with this child, and I just thought, wow, I, I almost had a baby. <laughs> Which is also what I thought last year when I had my abortion. <laughs> years. What happened was, young Henry, is that 
I was in the cryogenic sleep pod, dreaming of a whiter future. <laughs> I'm an anti-Semite, everyone says so. <laughs> and I was in my pod when suddenly there was a grand malfunction, and suddenly the pod was launched across the Atlantic, where it landed in Chepstow. And I've just been wandering the moors ever since. <laughs> That's British geography. <laughs> People also say, what about Disney? Why, despite the fact that you are an American man, do you suddenly look like a chubby Korean gentleman? <laughs> <laughs> And I say, no, 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 famous voice. I say, no, I'm not Korean, I'm just always, you know, squinting to see the dreams of the future. From my house in hell. But they also ask, what about Disney? How did you come up with your famous characters such as Mickey Mouse, Goofy the intelligent dog, and Pluto the stupid dog? <laughs> and I'll tell you as such. Um, hello, what's your name? Hello, Matt, very nice to meet you. Now, how would you come up with an idea to make a fantastic animated serial? Exactly, because you've never done bath salts. <laughs> Walt, you need to make an animated cartoon. I was like, one second, <coughs> snort. And then I'd go to the zoo, find an animal, and base a cartoon off that. So people laugh me, how did Mickey Mouse get made? I took a lot of bath salts, went down to the zoo, and saw a mouse riding a steamboat and winking at me. <laughs> As it turns out, it was actually a bath salt related hallucination. And what I really saw was a boy who'd fallen into the two cat enclosure. He was ripped to shreds, but not in my hallucination. <laughs> so I sat down and created the very first cartoon I'd ever be proud of and decided to name it after my bath salt dealer. Unfortunately, paddle boat Nigel was already taken. <laughs> so I went with Steamboat Willie after a thing I saw on the side of a moving cat. <laughs> Bananas. In pyjamas. Up coming down the stairs. Bananas. In pyjamas. They're coming down in pairs. <laughs> Bananas in pyjamas are catching teddy bears. Cause on Tuesdays they all try to catch them unawares. That is the song from a beloved children's show. Bananas in pyjamas about two bananas who frolic about in pyjamas. <laughs> and I've been thinking about the show a lot. And I've, uh, I've been thinking about it one bit in particular. Why? are these bananas in pyjamas? And I thought of the one reason why these bananas would be in bananas. Bananas <laughs> in pyjamas all the time. These bananas are terminally ill. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only explanation. <laughs> and they're not even that old. <laughs> you can tell them because they've not got those black blotches all over them. <laughs> We'd have to call banana toast. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they're taking the whole, they're taking the whole dying thing pretty well. I mean, they're still running up and down those stairs with the, with the vigor of their younger days. And um, but maybe one day, one day they won't come down those stairs. Maybe one day the teddy bears will wake up and wonder where their irritating banana friends have gone. And they'll walk up the banana stairs, open the banana bedroom door, look to the banana bed and see banana one lying still and cold as a regular banana. <laughs> and banana two cradling his lifeless friend and sobbing. That'll be a sad episode. So I wrote a song for it. <laughs> Bananas in pyjamas are coming down in pairs 
Bananas in pyjamas are chasing teddy bears Cause on Tuesdays they try to catch them unawares That's just an old one <laughs> Bananas in pyjamas, they're lying in their bed Bananas in pyjamas, thoughts going through their head Bananas in pyjamas, their hearts are filled with dread Cause on Tuesdays or any other day they might be fucking dead. Bananas <laughs> in pajamas, the deaths will make the bears sad. Bananas in pajamas, that'd be really bad. Cause the bears might jump in front of a moving car. Whose fault would it be? Why, those fucking bananas? Bananas in pajamas. Oh, bananas in pajamas. Oh, when I was <laughs> bananas, bananas in pajamas, bananas in pajamas, bananas in pajamas. <laughs> Their lies in their bed. Bananas in pajamas, thoughts running through their head. Bananas in pajamas, they're dying because they are ill.